What about a conflict between two real rights? For example, a Muslim cab driver who doesn't like to have seeing eye dogs or alcohol in his cab, but a blind man who needs to bring his seeing eye dog in the cab, and the government really has a limited number of cab licenses. Those are the facts of an incredible story that Lisa Morozik reports from Saskatchewan. We got a Christmas picture of this one. Meet Mike Simmons and his dog Graham. Graham is much more than your average house pet. To Mike, who has been almost fully blind for nearly 17 years, he truly is man's best friend and a welcome new addition to his life since July. And I've been losing more sight gradually too, so it just made sense. I couldn't have asked for a better timed opportunity to get the uh, the doggy llama. He is just the chosen one. He is an amazing dog. Being blind hasn't held Mike back. Back. He keeps busy by playing hockey and organizing the cross-country comedy fundraiser show Puck and Funny. Mike often uses taxis to get around the city, but only recently ran into problems hailing a cab. The reason? Graham. His first annoyance happened when he called to comfort cabs last October and mentioned his guide dog would be coming along. And they said they would send a pet-friendly taxi. I said, well, don't you mean a taxi? And he says, no, a pet-friendly taxi. And I asked, well, if there are a taxi, aren't they all guide dog friendly? And I was told no. Mike phoned Comfort Cabs the next day. The manager apologized and told him to reach out directly if it ever happened again. Six weeks later, it did. Mike was waiting with Graham outside of his apartment for a taxi when a passerby said one had been parked there for a while without acknowledging them. And I asked him, do you have a problem with dogs or is it something else? And that's when I was told right out that it was religious. Uh, a religious reason and I stated that that's unfortunate because if you're driving taxi in this country you have to know that you have to take these fares. A few days later he found himself waiting outside in the cold again and when he called Comfort Cabs to confirm his pickup time. I was told we're having a problem getting you a taxi because some of our drivers don't know what a service dog is. After the third strike of a cab company denying Simmons and his dog Graham not sure who could say no to this face. He decided to turn the issue over to the authorities. On November 17th, Simmons filed a complaint with the Saskatchewan Human Rights Commission. According to the Saskatchewan Human Rights Code, refusing services to a person with a service animal is prohibited. Cliff Coble is the operations manager for Comfort Cabs, and he says they have proper policies in place and took action after receiving Mike's complaints. I actually sent uh, notices out on our dispatch computer which every car gets, just reminded them of the rule that, that anybody with a service animal don't even question it. He says most of the drivers do comply with the rules and those who don't will be dealt with accordingly. In the meantime, Mike and Comfort Cabs are currently trying to resolve his complaint through a mediation process. I'm looking for education. I'm looking for fitting into the laws that apply. If there is any sort of financial retribution, the Guide Dogs for the Blind is definitely going to benefit from that. And as his story garners more attention, he is hoping all cab drivers will welcome him and Graham and all service animals with open doors. Reporting in Saskatoon, I'm Lisa Morozik with Sun News Network. You know, it's not just dogs. I was reading a story from London, England, where a family was in the car, and when the taxi driver realized they had bought liquor, not open liquor in the car, but just had bottles they were taking home, the taxi driver literally pulled over and threw them out of the cab. It's not as rare as you think. A majority of taxis in Minneapolis, Minnesota are driven by Muslim cabbies who refuse to take anyone in their cab who buy liquor from the duty-free stores. Where is the boundary between the religious freedom and the freedom of association of these Muslim Sharia cab drivers? And the public, who thinks that taxis are a government service, or at least a government franchise. Joining us now to talk about this is our friend Chris Schaefer from the Canadian Constitution Foundation. Great to see you again, Chris. Thanks, Ezra. You know, I'm reminded of that conversation we had about a year ago, where you had a lesbian customer who demanded a haircut from a Sharia Muslim barber, and he said, no, I don't touch girls, and she insisted, and she went to the Human Rights Commission. I sided with the barber, even though I thought he was a bigot, because I thought, you know what, she's looking for trouble, his property right, she can go across the street. But taxis, they're handed out, those licenses are handed out by the government. You can't just go to another competitor because the government bans competition they don't approve. I think you're right. There's a problem when you have a highly, highly regulated industry without any competition or very little. 
and you can't, you know, you and I can't just drive a car and take customers. So there's an issue there. But I think this really boils down to an employer-employee issue. No doubt when this ta uh, taxi company got their license from the government to operate as a taxi company, there were conditions. One of the conditions, although I don't know because I haven't seen the contract, but no doubt the condition was do you allow seeing guide dogs in all cars. Mm -hmm. The employee taxi driver no doubt probably had to sign something when he joined that taxi company that he or she wouldn't discriminate on the basis of a physical disability such as a guide dog. So there sounds like there's an employer-employee uh, employer relationship breakdown, contractual breakdown that needs to be fixed within that cab company itself before we ever even get to human rights uh, tribunals. Yeah, I don't like the idea of running to a human rights commission because, they, I mean, Saskatchewan's a little bit different. They're, they're now handled by real courts. It's still the goofy legislation, but instead of in front of a kangaroo court, Saskatchewan, I think they put it in Much better to have it that way, although I prefer much like the way things were dealt, you know, years before we had these human rights tribunals, you know, they just came about in the 60s or 70s. We used to handle this, you know, man to man, woman to woman, at a yeah. table, negotiate and compromise yeah. and reach a, an outcome that's mutually beneficial. Exactly. Much you better. don't have to make a federal case out of everything, but I think there is a problem. When I, and I give the example of Minnesota, Minneapolis, when... A, an outright majority, like a, a vast majority of cabbies are Muslim, and they've all decided we ain't going to take people with open liquor. Well, what's next? No guide dogs? No, no sorry, I didn't mean open liquor. liquor, closed liquor. Well, how about someone who's bringing ham home from the grocery store? How about an infidel, a Christian, a Jew, or, or a Hindu? I mean, seriously, at what point in time do you say you are breaking the separation between mosque and taxi cab? I wouldn't care if it was a private industry. But there is nothing more regulated than a cab industry. Those medallions are given out like gold. Yeah, and they are gold. They're worth a lot of money. Uh, so that's, I, I think you've raised a fundamental issue here. And you get the conflict of rights. And we're seeing that on an increasing basis, especially on, on when someone claims uh, a religious belief. Yeah. And you get that very challenging circumstance when it's a highly regulated, essentially almost like a government. Yeah. And then the argument could be the government ought not to discriminate. And I agree with that. But if things were left to the free market... Yeah. Uh, I think this situation would have a better outcome. Yeah, you could have your Koran cabs. Of course. You know, no liquor, no chicks. And you would know that. No Jews, and you whatever. Would, you would know that as a customer yeah. before you and got in the cab. And then you could cab. have cabs, you know, infidel cabs. Bring your ham, your booze, and you can be a woman uncovered. Uh, yeah, let the, look, and you know what? I hate to say it. There'd probably be enough business for the Koran cabs to keep them in business. I, I think there's another problem here, which is mass immigration by people who don't share our Western liberal values. I think that's an, a problem that's causing this class of human rights. Uh, there is that problem. Uh, and, and we have to, I think, also, uh, as this debate becomes increasingly prevalent in our society, distinguish between uh, real rights here and phony rights. Yeah. A real right is a negative right. It's universal and reciprocal. So, for example, I'll give you one quick example. You, have a, you and I have a right to life. It's yeah. universal. We both have it. It's reciprocal. I don't kill you. You don't kill me. The question becomes here, are the rights at issue in this particular story which one is universal and which one is reciprocal. They both have to be present. I would right. argue one of these sides does not have a real right. Mm, interesting. Great to have you on the show again. Thanks, Ezra.